Welcome to Art Minded, the Kimball Art Museum's podcast. I'm George Shackelford, Deputy Director of the Kimball Art Museum and curator with my colleague Esther Bell of the exhibition Renoir, The Body, The Senses. Esther is online with me and is curator of the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, Massachusetts, with whom we collaborated on the exhibition Renoir, The Body, The Senses, now on view at the Kimball Art Museum. Esther, won't you tell people a little bit about how we thought the idea of the show up? Absolutely. Just when I arrived at the Clark Art Institute about two and a half, three years ago, I knew that in the centenary year that we needed to celebrate Pierre-Auguste Renoir, because Renoir is one of the great strengths of the Clark's collections. And George, who is a, a dear friend, an esteemed colleague, I called him immediately and I said, George, I'm thinking about Renoir. What should I do? And George, I remember distinctly what you said, but maybe you could, <laughs> you could tell us. <laughs> it needs to be the nudes, Esther. <laughs> Exactly. It needs to be the nude. And um, and that's true for many reasons, but at the Clark, it made a lot of sense because two of our greatest masterpieces by Renoir feature the nude from different phases of his career. And we wanted to do the nude also because it's a subject that had never properly been explored in a major international exhibition. So we had, we had a, a big challenge ahead of us and it was a, a great joy to, to organize with you, George. I was so pleased when Esther invited the Kimball to uh, participate in the exhibition and to be a partner, because Renoir is a painter that is sadly lacking from our permanent collection, though we have done uh, a major exhibition of his work uh, 20 years ago that was very well received. So uh, having a chance to turn our attention to Renoir, an artist that I also had never worked on, gave us uh, an opportunity to sort of rediscover from the point of view of two uh, enthusiastic um, learners, in a way, the whole uh, subject of Renoir's treatment of the nude, which begins at the very beginning of his career in the 1860s and extends literally to the last year of his life. There have been other exhibitions about Renoir over the years, uh, Renoir portraits, Renoir and landscape, but this theme of, of the human body was one that had been not much treated over, the, over time. We started off with the great collection of the Clark Art Institute, which, as Esther says, is one of the most important uh, fundamental collections of Renoir in the world. But soon, Esther, we had to go on to uh, trying to convince other people to lend to our exhibition. That's right. And we had a, a very ambitious um, wish list, I, I think we could say. But one of the most important first steps was to approach our wonderful colleagues at the Musée d'Orsay, which is, of course, the great repository of Renoir in the world. And we took a trip to Paris and we sat down with the um, the chief curator there, Sylvie Patry, who is a great scholar of Renoir, who was the, um, the lead curator of Renoir in the 20th century, a very groundbreaking exhibition um, that took place in 2010. And we sat down with Sylvie and we explained what it was that we were trying to accomplish and why we needed the support of her institution. Um, we also chatted with Laurence Descartes, the, the director of, of that institution. And in the end, um, Sylvie was a, a great supporter of our project. She contributed a, a, a very rigorous essay to our catalog and also helped us with um, with loans that really our exhibition could not succeed with that. I think that's right. There are there are three critical paintings and one amazing pair of paintings that come from the Musée d'Orsay: the boy with a cat from 1868, the nude in the sunlight from 1876, uh, the the pair of odalisques from 196 and seven. And then finally, the bathers of 1918, 1919, which concludes the exhibition. 
really without our friends at Orsay, it would have been, uh, it almost would have been impossible to do the show, don't you think, Esther? Absolutely. Um, but along the way, we had a lot of, uh, of fun uh, discovering new pictures, finding paintings uh, that were in private collections, and communicating with our friends uh, around the world uh, to ask them for their support. Um, we went to institutions in London, um, in the United States. There are uh, critical loans from the National Gallery of Art, for instance. And uh, it was a great pleasure working with Esther to, uh, to accomplish all of these uh, loans for the exhibition. And George, I think that's something maybe a visitor to an exhibition doesn't perhaps know so much about, which is the the amount of labor that goes into securing each and every object, because each of those objects is priceless to the owner or the institution. And so a big part of our job was to really justify uh, the point of our exhibition and why each object was necessary. And since these these works came from all over the world, it was it was an extraordinary amount of, of work, though a great joy. Yeah. I think that that when you think about it, the visitor to an exhibition is in the show for an hour or so, but you have to realize that the works of art are going to be out of their homes for the greater part of a year. And so it's often, when you speak to someone, for instance, who's, whose Renoir is hanging in his or her bedroom, uh, you really can imagine how, how much of a challenge it would be to live without it for that length of time. I think one of the best uh, uh, stories, Esther, is when we went to visit um, a, a wonderful collector in Paris uh, who had owned a Renoir for all her life. That's right. And this is also a, a very special story um, in, in, in the kind of trajectory of our project, because this was a work that we had been looking for from the very, very beginning, and we're having no luck. We, we emailed, we called all of our friends and colleagues, and we just had no idea where, where to find this beautiful, beautiful thing. And it was really in the 11th hour almost through a fluke uh, that we, we discovered its location. And it was as simple as writing to this wonderful person and saying, we'd love to come and talk to you about this beautiful Renoir that you own. And, and this person invited us into, into um, her home and was so gracious. And I think for me, that moment of walking in to this private residential space and seeing it on the wall was one of the great highlights of our Renoir adventure. And the paint, the, the drawing in question is a beautiful uh, image of a girl splashing water at friends and it's drawn in red chalk on uh, wonderful tracing paper. And it's, it's almost, almost life-size. It feels like it's a very big drawing. And the, the work is really interesting because we think it it relates very closely to the final stages of a painting that, because it belongs to a collection that cannot lend it, uh, we we were unable to have for the show. So finding this painting, this drawing rather, in a Parisian private collection and being, as Esther says, so welcomed into the home of the owner was really fascinating. She told us uh, that her grandfather had bought this drawing directly from the artist through the dealer Ambrose Vollard at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. And the work has remained in her hands or in her family's hands ever since, and she's now in her 90s. So to, uh, to grant us this loan was really a great thing on her part. And it was literally in in the in the, the sitting room or the dining room, some a place where um, the family spends a lot of time. And so to physically remove it is is a great sacrifice on behalf of the family. And um, George, I remember her sons being there with us, and it was a really special moment for us to express to to the family how important this work of art is and and how much it would be valued as a part of our project. One of the things that people take away, I believe, from Renoir, The Body, The Senses, 
is the surprise at seeing Renoir's works compared with uh, the works of other artists. Uh, I think that securing some of those loans and identifying the, the, the loans, in fact, that we most needed uh, was, a, was a challenging and interesting part of the exhibition. I think we could start with the delightful saga of Boucher's Diana at the Bath. Well, I, I would I would love to to reminisce about um, our our journey to to bring that loan to our exhibition. It is a we're referring to a painting by Francois Boucher called Diana Leaving Her Bath, which is one of the most important French Rococo 18th century paintings in the Louvre's collection, and it was the painting that Renoir talked about as his first love. Um, in which he talks about Boucher's mastery of the, the female body. And so we knew that we had to have this painting, but it's so central to the Louvre's collection. So it was a big sacrifice on their part to loan it. And in the beginning, George, I think it's fair to say we weren't that confident it would happen. Um, and in fact, we were told no to, to start off. <laughs> <laughs> and that and that is true. But then we um, we argued our case, and our colleagues there were ultimately extremely supportive. And it came to our exhibition. And I would say it's one of the the real highlights in terms of comparing Renoir to the artist who inspired him. And I honestly can't imagine the exhibition without that painting. As a friend of mine said yesterday when we were walking through the show, it really anchors this uh, a whole section of the exhibition, which deals with Renoir's fascination with the 18th century and his interest in, uh, in the qualities of art, its abstract qualities, its purely formal qualities that uh, we call the decorative or decoration. Um, just a, a backup story, I was reading Esther's wonderful essay on Renoir in the 18th century, and where she talked at length about this painting by Boucher. And I said to myself, I'm not going to take the first no for an answer. So I, lit I was on a plane. I got on, uh, on the email on the plane and sent an email to the curator at the Louvre saying, read this about what Renoir said about this painting in uh, the 20th century. And are you sure you can't lend it? And sure enough, they turned around and uh, and agreed to lend. It was a surprise and a great delight. But but no one can resist George Shackelford. <laughs> I think that's the moral of, of this of the story. <laughs> well, and, and here also it, you were you were uh, respecting Renoir's opinion too, which is fantastic because the Louvre doesn't collect Renoir, and for them to realize his importance in reflection almost on their collection, it was it was really a great support. We had loans from private collectors in the United States and abroad. Um, there's a wonderful pastel by Degas that comes from a private collection in Fort Worth. There are paintings by Courbet that comes from a private collection in New York. Um, there are two amazing uh, paintings by Picasso from the later part of his career that come from the Neymad collection in Switzerland. And Picasso, I think, is one of the artists that people are most surprised to encounter in this exhibition, wouldn't you say? I would say so. And I think the the story of his legacy, um, how Renoir impacted Picasso, Pierre Bonnard, Henri Matisse, is a, a real surprise to some of our visitors. And so I believe that some of those juxtapositions are um, some of the most powerful in, in the exhibition. And in fact, two of the Renoirs uh, belonged to Picasso. Exactly. So um, and I, I, for me personally, the, the bust of a model, um, this beautiful late painting by Renoir that was in Picasso's collection is one of the most beautiful paintings in the exhibition. And at first, when you see it, 
it, you, it might take you some time to understand why Picasso could be so interested in the formal qualities of this painting. But once you live with the painting and you see it alongside Picasso's own work, it makes absolute sense. And it's a it's a real eureka moment. And George, I know at the Kimball, you've included an image of that painting in Picasso's studio, where it's that's right. serving, it's a, it's a site of inspiration for him. And I think that's so interesting to be able to see, um, to see it in that context. Picasso's fascination with Renoir began during Renoir's lifetime in the late teens and really endured uh, throughout his life. The, the photograph that you reference was actually taken in the late 1950s. So 40 years after Renoir has died, Picasso is still thinking about him. In fact, one of the paintings in the exhibition, The Seated Bather, uh, which many people are surprised to see when they encounter it at the Picasso Museum, is really important to Picasso's work. He almost copies it directly. This, in fact, shows how important that and how potent Renoir was for Picasso at the time of the, the older artist's death in 1919. Picasso went out and bought these paintings by Renoir very early and begins to assimilate Renoir's lessons into his art long, long beyond the time when the paintings actually uh, so much resemble the work of Renoir. We were very lucky to have these two loans from the Picasso Museum in Paris, but also, as I said, from the Neymad Collection, a beautiful oil painting from 1921, and then a surprising painting from much closer to the end of Picasso's career, showing two bathers uh, in a landscape. And in, in Fort Worth, we have hung that painting immediately opposite the great late painting by Renoir, which I think, Esther, is one of your very favorites in the show. Yes, one of my favorite paintings, bar none, in the exhibition is The Bathers of 1918, 1919, which some refer to as Renoir's manifesto painting, his masterpiece. Uh, Matisse, for instance, called, said of it that death had no place. And this is a painting that has been controversial almost since it was first exhibited um, after Renoir's death, when his sons offered it to the Musée National in um, 1922, um, the board wasn't sure that they wanted to accept it because there was much debate about Renoir's late style. Um, so despite the debate, however, Picasso admired this painting, Matisse uh, admired this painting, Bonar admired this painting. So many people um, saw the great merits in, in this painting. But it's a difficult painting for many because the flesh seems to have no skin, the body seem to have no, no containment. Um, it's almost a swirling, um, dizzying mass of color. And to me, this is what's so incredible about it, is that it's really challenging us to, to find the beauty, to, to find the, the sense in, in the placement of the bodies and the figures and the flowers and these formal qualities. But it is a work of true modernism. And so it's a painting, having known that it was quote unquote controversial, that to me, I wanted to spend as much time with it as possible. And in the end, I would say that that I am um, I am blown away by it. I, I think it's one of the great paintings of the 20th century. I feel the same way. And, it, and while this painting, The Bathers of 1918, 1919, is the Renoir that people love to hate. Uh, and I, I found myself being one of those when I first saw it in my 20s. Uh, in Paris, and I thought, wow, this painting is strange and ugly and weird. And now that I have really gotten into the Renoir groove, if you will, I, I find it a, a painting which is almost inevitable. You come to the end of the exhibition and and you say, well, of course it has to end in this direction. Of course these, these abstracted figures where the forms really aren't about nature any longer, but are about subjects for paint. Uh, that becomes the, the real theme of the, of the end of Renoir's career. And uh, if you start this exhibition at the beginning, thinking that you're going to try to get inside Renoir's mind,
and you try to follow him from the sort of quasi-academic style of the 1860s to the breakthrough of Impressionist color in the 1870s to the transformation of his art after he goes to Italy in the 1880s, at which point the rest of his career seems to be about making art rather than representing nature. And the, the monumental paintings of the 1890s at the beginning of the 20th century, well, of course, the great painters at the end is, this, uh, is the culmination of this career. George, just to um, to follow up on what you said, I I agree. I think this is where paint is transcending subject, and these aren't bodies, but these are painted surfaces, and they are so inventive and beautiful and complex. And I think this is a reason that so many working artists today have been responding to this exhibition, because Renoir is a painter's painter. And I think it's very obvious in, in The Bathers of 1918-1919. Esther, it has been a great pleasure talking to you today, but more important, it's been such a pleasure working with you on this project. And I agree, we've got to find another project to, to co-curate in the future. I I, um, I agree, and it has been one of my my great, the great pleasures of my career working on this project with you, George, and I, I am so fond of the Kimball Art Museum. Well, we are fond of you too, and we are so excited that this exhibition has been brought to Fort Worth. Everyone is uh, is loving it, and we uh, hope that if you haven't yet seen the show and you're listening to this while it's still open, uh, before the end of January 2020, that you'll come to see the show. For the Kimball Art Museum, I'm George Shackelford, Deputy Director, and we thank you for coming to Art Minded, the Kimball Art Museum's podcast. Please visit the Kimball soon and come to see us all the time on kimballart.org.